Hello, and welcome to a bonus Presto Music podcast. The character of Piero, the sad clown dressed in all white from the world of Commedia dell'arte, has been an inspiration for artists and musicians for centuries, from the Rococo painter Watteau of the 17th century through to 21st century icons like David Bowie. The latest artist to fall under the spell of Piero is the ceaselessly inquisitive Patricia Kobajinskaya, who has put down her violin to portray Piero in a new recording of Arnold Schoenberg's masterpiece of high modernism from 1912, Piero Lunaire, a setting of text by Albert Giraud, in which the poetical protagonist Piero is surrounded by symbolist imagery. Patricia Kopajinskaya was very kind to spare some time from her busy schedule to record answers to some questions I had about the recording and her ideas about and connection to the titular character. Many congratulations on this extraordinary recording of Piero Lunaire, a role which comes across as your alter ego. What was your first encounter with Piero and why do you feel such affinity and connection to this version of Piero in particular? In my homeland, the former Soviet Republic Moldova, we did not have the possibility to, to listen or to know, to read about contemporary music in the Western. So I didn't know very much about Schoenberg or the Second Viennese School. But after our immigration to Vienna, this was an experience of novelty and freedom. And I mean freedom in, also in a political sense. So I, of course, as a young student soaked up Schoenberg as a violinist and, and a listener um, looked up all his scores and books about him and the rest of the contemporary music uh, like a sponge. This is the air I breathe. This is what means for me to live today as a musician. And then Pierrot was really a milestone, a turning point in the development of all this. I played it often as a violinist and viola player, but I always had a secret wish to become Pierrot myself. Perhaps because Pierrot is a lost soul in the Mm, reality. He is longing for longing, so to say, dreaming and experiencing uh, absurdity. I always felt attached to surreal, unexplainable worlds of this timeless figure. What do you feel it is about the archetype of Piero that continues to inspire painters, writers, composers and performers? Are all artists, to a greater or lesser extent, Piero? A lot of bourgeois existence is about facade. The facade comes in many forms. Let's think today it's probably the Botox, the made-to-measure suit, an expensive car, holidays in the Maldives, the expensive seat in the opera, etc. The original Commedia dell'arte and De Bureau's Pierrot in Paris did away with facades and showed the naked human existence as it is. Censorship forbade Pierrot to speak on stage, as we know, but even being mute, he made a strong impression and alone his presence was a sort of protest. In this sense, Pierrot is an artistically utmost inspiring and even revolutionary figure. Anyway, an antithesis to the stiff culture of the high bourgeoisie, uh, with frequented the opera and the comédie française, the, the much more expensive theatres. Piero is often viewed as a blank canvas for artists. Do you feel you paint your colours, so to speak, over Piero? I don't paint anything over him. I just slip into his skin, becoming him, and then look through his eyes and fantasy and incredible stories he tells and of course speak through his, through, through the music of Schoenberg
Uriens Grün und bemalt sein Gesicht in erhabenem Stil mit dem fantastischen Monster. Pierrot's fractured mental state is brilliantly expressed in the music. What mental state do you have to get into to become Pierrot? And what impact has playing Piero had on your own mind in the six years you have been performing the piece? Rather than altering my state of mind, Piero became an asylum for my own fractured mind. Being him, I can just be myself. And he had a deep influence on my performing style. If I look back, I first noticed this in St. Paul in US when I played Pierrot and Mozart Violin Concerto in the same evening, together with St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. It was a very strong experience for me because Mozart in this moment left any conventional paths that had still remained in me from the studies and became kind of opera buffa. Pierrot himself played the Mozart. And this became an abstract and absurd game, art pour l'art, maybe. And Pierrot was so much nearer to Mozart than I ever was, as myself. I now feel this liberating hand of Pierrot in any pieces I touch. May it be Beethoven or um, also Schoenberg or anything else. It's a kind of Dadaistic state of spirit. Um, so, away with the cages of convention. Giro and Schoenberg's depiction is, for me, strongly associated with the world of Freudian psychoanalysis. Can we understand the past through the changing depictions of Pierrot? Giro's Pierrot came from Paris. And as I understand, Freud built his psychoanalysis on the foundations of Charcot's Paris School of Neurology. Both, of course, explore the irrational, the dreams and nightmares. But I don't know if Pierrot can help us to understand the past. He always was the fool who dares to express the truth with words or without words, if censored, with silence. With this, he helped human beings to understand themselves at all times. How would a contemporary artist or composer depict Pierrot today? Pierrot is not even a figure. It's a state of mind and doesn't depend of time or place. For me, it's kind of station or territory called zero, where everything is possible, even the impossible. He is maybe a little like the little prince of Saint-Exupéry, naive, vulnerable outsider, always questioning, and he doesn't belong anywhere. I think they both don't even know who they are. On this album, you've mixed modernist Schoenberg and Webern with the bourgeois Strauss and Chrysler. Can you explain some of the thinking behind connecting these two very different worlds, which both existed in Fond de Sec Vienna? And what connections are there with contemporary events? Schoenberg himself came from the imperial Fond de Sec world of Mahler and of the Kaiserwalzer. And Schoenberg's Pierrot punctuated the end of this epoch, as did the death of Mahler. There is also the music hall aspect. Giraud must have known the Paris cabaret Chat Noir because his poem Night relates to a picture 
which hung there. The Chat Noir pioneered shows and chansons. A copy of the Chat Noir was the Überbrettl Theater in Berlin, where Schoenberg was the house composer and produced his um, Überbrettl songs, very humorous music, somehow precursors of Pierrot. We had to fill the CD, and since Schoenberg himself had arranged the Kaiser Walzer for his tour with Pierrot people, uh, Pierrot Lunaire's uh, ensemble, in Spain, this was an obvious choice. And there is an exhilarating photo of Fritz Kreisler at the violin and Schoenberg at the cello making Austrian folk music with some friends in a small band resembling the Pierrot ensemble. So Kreisler had to be there too, of course. I think there is an anecdote about Fritz Kreisler who uh, told Schoenberg that he heard a piece of him until, and he liked it and Schoenberg told him, oh, please don't tell it to anybody, um, otherwise you ruin my um, reputation. <laughs> so I think they belong on the same CD. And of course in the poems of Giraud and the paintings of Villette who decorated the Chat Noir, we feel the end of their epoch, even the menace of the coming First World War. Schwarze Riesenfalter, of course, is the, the, the fear, the threat they see. And everybody felt it, of course, at that time. These parallels feelings about our own epoch, for instance, Greta Thunberg's mute protest before the Swedish parliament. This protest of a teenager, a very clever teenager, was uh, very much in the footsteps of Pierrot for me. She tells us the truth, the very uncomfortable truth. I'm always amazed by your intellectual curiosity and your programmes and recordings are clearly the result of many hours of thought and research. Where do you feel this almost insatiable curiosity comes from? Well, in some conservatories and competitions, musical performance is trained and judged mostly like a sports discipline. For instance, gymnastics. Sense is replaced by the consensus of elderly teachers about a spotless exec execution. But isn't that just boring? And, in my opinion, a complete nonsense. If you take any musical masterpiece from Palestrina to Schoenberg or Antail or whoever, these pieces came from human beings with very particular biographies, from traditions, from a culture, from models and influences. And some had causes in friendships, loves, politics, wars, commissions or economic dependencies. And there are always parallels in other art forms. You just have to, to, to look for them, for these connections. Like mushrooms, you see them on the surface, but looking under the soil, you will see that they are all connected. Take Schubert's trout, song um, or the quintet. Everybody knew at that time. This poem behind is a desperate parable for political freedom. Shostakovich's first violin concerto, a visceral description of the Stalinistic terror, a fact much more important than uh, bowings and fingerings, or take m much of Brahms, Johannes Brahms, which expresses um, delicate but unfulf unfulfilled longings. But so often Brahms' delicacy is literally executed by, by self-assured perfection, fat sound and uh, huge vibrato. 
to feel the sense of a composition, you have to put yourself into the composer's time and mind and then to reconstruct how the piece arose in his head. Where is the muse coming from? What is the, the way through, through his feather to the paper? And what does he want to, to say with this piece? That's the core of, of, the, of the task, what we have to put on stage, what we have to transmit to the, to the heart of the listener. And for this, you cannot know enough. Only then can the piece happen in your head and in the minds of the audience. And this is not just another task, but it's very entertaining and fun. We are lucky to live uh, 600 meters from the University Library and the Musicology Institute, so from time to time we bring home a bicycle load of books and go through them, not with the mind of a, of a musicologist, but in a search of stories and sense. I think the most interesting thing is the, the story behind the score, not the notes themselves. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Patricia, for taking the time to answer my questions. Your recording of Piero Lunaire continues your tradition of engaging with music in a completely fresh, inquisitive and rewarding way. And I look forward to your next project with great anticipation, either with a violin or without. Patricia Kopachinskaya's recording of Piero Lunaire, coupled with works by Weber, Strauss and Chrysler, is available on Alpha Classics. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thanks to my producer, Matt Groom, and thanks to you for listening. Thank <laughs> you.